All right. Shalom to our friends on Facebook and shalom to our friends here on Zoom who are in this new reality as we're trying to make our way through uncertain times. Of course, we've been processing that as a community saying, when were certain times? Today we're reading from Romans chapter 1 and uh, from verse number um, uh, 18. I'm going to share my screen for just a moment so you can see, pardon me, Facebook Live people. I'm going to share my screen so you can see that we are looking at this second section of the letter to the Romans called Sin and What It Is. First, the bad news. Last week, we looked at the introduction of this. For those watching online, I'm going to paste something later. It's a YouTube video, a seven minute introduction that showcases the great graphics in the first four chapters of this book. The theme, how to get right with God. That's a pretty good topic. Look, today in Australia is Good Friday, and I want to talk about good things and the bad things which usually precede them. We are in the midst of a lockdown throughout the world due to COVID-19. No one thinks this is a good thing. But as a result of going through this, many are finding good behaviors reinstated, good relationships fixed, and good coming out of this tragedy. Good Friday is the day in history when Yeshua died on a Roman cross. If you believe in him as Messiah and Savior, it's a great day. It's the day when our righteous Messiah took the sins of the world on his shoulders. And according to Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah the prophet, we read, quote, The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you don't believe in Jesus, then Good Friday is a day of unspeakable trauma to a good man. A day which should be called No Good Friday when a good man copped unbelievable and unbearable evil. For believers, what makes Good Friday good is that Yeshua died in our place and rose again in triumph on Sunday morning. Good overcomes evil. The other night was Wednesday night, was uh, Passover. Of course, our family, and, and maybe yours as well, was celebrating Passover. And we ate Unusual items. Really, we don't usually find these in the fridge. We pulled out parsley, we dipped it in salt water. Horseradish, and we stuck it on some unleavened bread, some matzah. Egg was also dipped in salt water. We remembered the pain of the house of bondage. We experienced life as if we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. The only real way to rejoice in our deliverance is to remember that we were slaves. You don't know joy unless you remember that from which you've been delivered. In today's reading, beginning at chapter 1 in the book of Romans, verse 18, we see some seriously bad information. That is, we see bad news. And no one, at least no one I want to hang around with, ever wants to listen only to bad news. Look, I'll often ask people when I see them reading a newspaper alone, say in a cafe, uh, anything good in the paper today? And almost to a man, they will insist, oh, no, never anything good in it. And yet they buy the paper. <laughs> Curious, isn't it? Tragedy, failure, despair, loss. These are realities to be sure, but they're not our go-to when we go to the movies or go-to broadcasts. We want good news, don't we? But this section of the book of Romans is going to highlight human failure and God's justice. This lesson won't get me on the cover of Time magazine. Last week, we began this teaching on the book of the Bible titled Romans. <clears throat> it's not really a book. It was actually a letter written by the former rabbi Saul of Tarsus to the Roman believers. 
We saw in last week's episode, if you will, the great themes that Saul, now Paul, would be unpacking in this letter. In today's lesson, we begin the second section, which you can see in the outline from J. Vernon McGee. By the way, that's all I took from this Bible teacher from the last century. For my personal study, I've used the academic research of Donald Robinson, of Michael Byrd, John Murray, Stuart Briscoe, and James D.G. Dunn. <laughs> there are so many others I would recommend, including John Stott, N.T. Wright, and Timothy Keller. But get this, the main book <laughs> that I use, that I like to read to interpret the Bible, it's the Bible itself. And we will need that reference book more than ever as we enter this second section of the Book of Romans, which J. Vernon McGee titled, Sin, What It Is, or as Briscoe called it, First, The Bad News. <laughs> so chapter 1, verse 18, through to chapter 2, verse 16. Look, I want to remember the overarching theme of this book, as Warren Wearsby titled it in his study book, be right. That is, this book is all about getting right with God and being right. Hmm. Let's go through this line by line. God's wrath, it says in verse 18, is revealed from heaven. Paul doesn't say how it's revealed, but Jewish people, and dare I say Greeks in Paul's day, would have understood retribution. Evil has consequences. Do good, you'll get bad results. There's no need to prove this allegation. Literally, the known world in those days got it. I wonder if we get it in our day, that if you sow unrighteousness, you'll reap bad results. What's the cause? Paul says that this wrath is coming because we are suppressing the truth. That's not about axioms or absolute ideals, but rather the way we learned about God and then disregarded it. It's man versus God. It's man versus man. It's the battle of souls against what they already know or have learned about God. He starts with his identity in verse 20, creator. He's known in every society worldwide, the most remote village, the highest cathedral, everywhere there is a divine, actually the divine of divines, the unknown God in Acts chapter 17, the one among many. The, the Native Americans called him the Great Spirit. Uh, Orthodox Jews won't say Jehovah, but will title him that the higher power of the 12 steps. Look, everybody describes a God who reveals himself at the beach or on top of a mountain as we look over grasslands and empty spaces. He is numero uno, to be Spanish. As a result, we are without excuse in rejecting him and suppressing that truth about him. Look how we behaved in response. We knew he was God, whatever that looked like, verse 21, and we suppressed the truth, verse 18. We didn't honor, that's doxus, him as God or even give thanks. We became futile in our speculations. Let me talk about those, those two words, suppression and uh, speculation. Suppression doesn't mean we didn't know. It meant we did know and gave it away. We said, no thanks. We said, That's, I'm, that should stay away from me. And this idea of speculation, I really want to comment on this. Let me see, by the way, if I can increase this. Yeah, I should be able to do it. Pardon me. Um, as I make the whole unit here bigger. And then, what did the Apostle Paul do without a computer and a Zoom? I don't, I don't know how he did that. This idea of speculation, uh, it's the Greek word dialogue. And dialogue today sounds like a very good thing. Dialogue sounds like 
you know, you have your idea, I have my idea, let's converse, let's share together. Hey, I don't want a monologue, I want a dialogue, let's talk about it. And that's a very honorable thing. I was listening to a podcast on a TED Talk from a couple years ago, just this week, that was a replay. And they were talking about dialogue and, and how to have a debate. And in debate, you want to have common ground, not oppositional ground. That's the way to win. I, I really enjoyed that conversation. Dialogue, though, in this text has to do with speculation. That is, I heard it and I want to dialogue against it so that it's not really a conversation in our term, but it is a hostile disagreement. And that's why the apostle here says we became futile in our speculations. Our foolish heart was darkened. Heart. Our heart is the center of our being. It's our, in modern terms, DNA. What we're made of, if you will, our matrix of life, that which defines us, our character, our essence, our being itself, that became darkened. Why? Because we speculated against God. We dialogued against him. That's not saying we can't have conversation with God. What I'm saying is that we can't argue against him in the sense of resisting his will. Paul used that sentiment later in his citation in chapter 11, when he says, let their eyes be darkened so as they so as to see not, and they're bend their backs forever. That's in chapter 11. And again, to the Ephesians, Paul wrote and said that they were darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So it's not a matter of, gee, I didn't know, but that we resisted what we do know. Darkness is the withdrawal from the light that is available. It's willful. It's not merely a lack of awareness. It's hostile choice against the light. In other words, as Dunn says, quote, by withholding the appropriate recognition of God, they became less, not more, able to function as rational beings. Failure to recognize their own creatureliness, his word, not mine, brought with it a decreasing ability to function as a human being. Our dialogue is really our hostile rejection of the truth as we knew it, and God's grace was there all the time in that he revealed himself to us in creation and in his invisible attributes, his divine nature, like love, like a sense of right and wrong, justice, kindness, fairness. These are part of God who is and, and what we learn and how we live in a just society. Verse 23 says, our exchange is evidenced in idolatry. And he lists all kinds of things. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments that we broke, and the one which persists to this day, to be sure. We love stuff. We love honor and approval. We look for society to shout our praise and we like the stuff of winners, whether it's the decorations of sports heroes on our walls or the clothes we wear, or the celebrities we adore on the television and whom we think we know because we're mesmerized by their every action. Idolatry is the number one sin of today, making anything and everything other than God into our own God. We want human enterprise and humanity itself over the this being otherwise known as less, civil society as the God of heaven and earth. And it shouldn't be missed since creation, it says in the text, highlights the actual list of things created in Genesis 1. Nor should we miss the image and likeness as Paul uses those phrase, the, the exact ideas of God creating man in his image and likeness. So what will God do as a result? Verses 24 to the end of the chapter, excuse me, highlights a threefold downward spiral of our own making and of God's activity. He turns us over to our own impurities 
Why? If you exchange truth, a lethos, the Greek word, for a lie, pseudo in the Greek, that's why. Because we've exchanged something. We, we took the, the value that we had in our spiritual wallet and we went somewhere and changed it in at, at the exchange place. A lethos, truth, means not hidden. It's revealed then we take the pseudo real. So in other words, we learn something, it's alethos, it's truth. We see it, we compartmentalize it and say, no, that's not for us. And we accept something that's fake, uh, or the Bible calls it a lie. It's not only the axiomatic truths, it's the truth about God and his being and his relationship with us. Remember, Pontius Pilate asked pretty much this, this week, uh, we anniversarized that. He asked Yeshua, what is truth? And the irony is the truth was standing right in front of him at the moment. Truth, the nature of God, the revealed ancient of days, the Messiah who gave himself to die on our behalf. Truth is Yeshua. He even said, I am the way, I am met, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. He's not an information piece to study and then to dispense. He's the eternal Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. No wonder praise and honor are his. No wonder we should shout and sing of his goodness. And no wonder he's going to withdraw from us if we suppress or reject him. Verse 26 says, if we persist, that is, if we continue in this narishkeit, this nonsense, we're going to be turned over again to what says here, degrading passions. Now, some commentators think that these three turn over phrases indicate sameness but I see them as growing and developing, spiraling away from the Almighty, his love being rejected, our decay increasing. And yet, in all of it, he still reaches out to us and longs for us to, to, to stop in this downward spiral at any time. Please, I almost hear him cry, come back to me. So in verse 25, our sin was lustful. In verses 26 and 27, we see homosexuality described for men and for women very clearly. There are some who aver that this was not Paul's intention. They say it's the burning and not the act itself which is in view. If they think that, they're not Jewish. Think about it. Paul uses very clear adjectives to describe the repulsion and the misbehavior, not the level of activity or the wrong attitude to the, uh, in the allowed homosexual enterprise. He's clearly saying that God made us to be male and female and anything outside that is degrading and wrong. And it's a function of missing the point. And that point is to know and honor God with all our hearts, our minds and our strength. That's our bodies. Verse 28 to 31 showcase the continual downward spiral of those who knock God and his love. They're evident in greedy, envious, murderous, disobedient to parents. You, you heard the list as I read it. The list doesn't ever really end. The list, sorry, the first commandment gets broken, then all the rest follow suit. They know what they're doing, but they go ahead anyway. This is in your face rejection of the Almighty and his authority. I, I was thinking of the verse from the Proverbs, the adulteress wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Hmm. Reject God as God and you make yourself to be God. And then all hell breaks loose, literally. Remember Pharaoh in the Exodus story. We just read it this week at Passover. He hardened his heart the Bible says three different times, Exodus 8, 15, 8, 32, and 8, 34, after subsequent plagues. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart, 
chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 10, and chapter 14, verse 4. It sounds like this triad of God giving over the Romans who rejected him. I harden my heart, God turns me over. I harden my heart, God hardens my heart. So it's a quid pro quo, if you will. Chapter 2 brings us the judgment of God. Now that's not very exciting, and as I said at the beginning, it's kind of, kind of, uh, how shall we say, not a draw card. Uh, Bob, you know, you want to go Facebook Live, why don't you talk about good things and happy things and sing some songs, and maybe we'll do that next week. But I don't think so. First, the bad news before we get the good news. Remember, the, uh, the, this is also justice. It's all about our relationship with people. Chapter 1 rightly describes an individual in his hopeless estate who rejects God and suppresses truth. Chapter 2 shows our inability to get along. What's the issue? We judge one another. And this is not the only time in the letter that Paul will address judging others. I guess Paul is saying that if wrong is happening, then judgment should follow. And that was pretty common in those days. And I think most people in these days, although I hear it on the pickleball court when people say, ah, karma, you cheated, it came back to bite you. I'm not sure that instant karma is what everybody has in mind, but you get the idea. Judgment should follow wrong behavior. But human justice is warped and in need of repair. We need someone from the outside to show us true and truth judgment. You judge others, Paul says, you're without excuse. <laughs> He's already said that word without apology, inexcusable, in chapter 1, verse 20. Which, by the way, if you know the paintings of, I'm sorry, the photography of Ken Duncan, the great Australian photographer, at every one of his stores, uh, wherever they still are and wherever they might still be open, Ken Duncan has that verse, Romans 1, 20, in a plaque everywhere. It's a, a beautiful testimony to what he sees in nature as he photographs a lot of that. So Paul says that you're without excuse since you practice the same wrongs. Verse 2, he again repeats without example the obvious God will judge determination. And have you seen this before? Um, I'm not sure if our Zoomers and Facebook Livers are seeing it all together at the same time. I'll try to use both hands. When you point with one finger, three come back at you. You judge, you'll be judged. You do the same very things that you are criticizing in others. So what is God thinking in, as this takes place? Look, look at verse 4. I really want to highlight this. Kindness, tolerance, patience, and it's the goodness of God that leads us back to repentance. Do those words ring of an angry God? Do they sound like a hostile, vindictive deity who's keeping score in heaven and can't wait to injure those who fail? Not at all. These are the words of the divine nature. That's what Paul said in 120. That is revealed. Truth, the word means not hidden, is for all people. It's not about God, the examiner, who can't wait to punish us. It's about God, who is our Father, and gracious, and longs to relate to us. He wants us to get this. He wants us to get this right, and he's ever helping us go there. Chapter 2, verse 5, sounds like Paul lingered at 4. <laughs> I think of that sometimes. I don't know if you journal, but I try to. I've got mine right here. And when I write and I say something, wow, that's really good. Not that I do that that often, but when I write something that really says, yeah, that's what I want to think on, I just stop. I pause. The Hebrew word selah means pause and think about it. And you'll see that in the Psalms. So as I, as I write, or as I'm imagining, I'm projecting, you'll forgive me, uh, Paul, an earlier Jew for Jesus, wrote about the goodness of God that leads to repentance, I think 
he's pondering that and thinking, you God are so good, you brought me to repentance. I think he's he's going to have his own doxology at that moment, singing a, a praise song. And then he gets back to it. In verse 5 he says, But because of your rejection, now titled stubbornness and unrepentance, you're doing something. You are storing up wrath for yourself. The Greek word for storing up is the same word as thesaurus, which is a stockpile of or a storing of words. He says you've got a thesaurus of wrath that God is, that you've done. It's not God mounting up all your sins and saying, ah, I caught you doing that, I caught you doing that. But you store up for yourself this wrath. It's not God's will. He doesn't delight in sending people to hell. He wants everyone to be his. And yet, God's justice. Let me give you some statements of God's justice. I think there are six of them here. I'll give them to you. And by the way, the whole manuscript of this talk, except for my excurses, uh, will be on my blog later this afternoon. And I hope that you will go back and look at some of the Bible verses or argue with me about that, whether on the blog or back here on Facebook. When I stop this lecture, by the way, um, in just a few moments, I'm going to finish with Facebook Live and I'll exit there. But Zoom will continue and every Friday here in Sydney, 10 a.m., so what is that, 8 p.m. in New York and 7 p.m. in Chicago? You get the idea. Across the world, it's different times. We will continue this series on the Book of Romans. And I will let you interact with me. So in Zoom, we interact. On Facebook Live, we don't. All right. Let me give you these six theses or ideas about God's justice. Number one, it's according to truth. You see that in verse 2. We've already addressed this. The visible, tangible, real, already shown evidence of the Almighty to humanity. Secondly, God's judgment is inescapable. That's in verse 3. No one can get away from it. God being God. He's the God of the universe. He's the God of North America. He's the God of South Africa. He's the God of the planet. He knows who and where we are. He's in, it's inescapable. Number three, it's cumulative. So it's for <laughs> verses four and five. There's no one who escapes, and it's not just, well, I did today pretty well. That ought to count. Mm, it's cumulative. Number four, God's judgment is based on man's actions. It says he will render to every man according to his deeds. A couple verses on that that you might want to look up. Proverbs 24, verse 12. And 1 Kings chapter 8, verse number 39. Those are from the Older Testament. So that you can see it's one book, Older and Newer Testament. It's not like, uh, let's dump that old one and bring in the new stuff. No, it's all, it's all one book and a good book at that. Based on our deeds, God is a righteous judge. Number five, he's impartial, verses 11 to 15. Jewish people and Gentiles are going to be judged in that order. There's no impartiality with God, which might make some boast that they are in like Flint. Phew God will be fair. That means I'll be okay, they say. Why? I basically keep the Ten Commandments, they say. I basically do good to people. I didn't buy more toilet paper than I was allotted last week. I gave an extra bit in the... Uh, in the Salvation Army kettle when they approached me last Christmas. We think we're pretty good. Next week we'll see that more clearly. Number six, God's judgment is inevitable, verse 16. Sounds like Gentiles don't have a prayer. <laughs> sorry, folks. Uh, Paul does seem to exclude everyone, sorry, to include everyone in this judgment concept. But this makes one wonder. If the Jewish people are included in this pervasive and exhaustive, determined judgment to befall the world, is anyone able to escape? And if anyone is, then surely the Jewish people, God's chosen people, are in that second category, right? We'll look at that next week, God willing. Next week, what about the Jews? 
Are we better off? Are we actually worse off? Well, with that, I'm going to wish you all a happy Passover as you continue celebrating and eating matzah and try to be more clever. Yesterday, my grandson and I had some fried matzah. I think he ate almost more of it than I did. I mean, he really loved it. But try to eat that for seven straight days. We'll see what we can do. We'll mix in other stuff. Maybe I'll put some tomato sauce, some ketchup on top of it and make it a little more savory. Friends, uh, a blessed uh, celebration of the Feast of the First Fruits on Sunday. That is resurrection. That's what this is all about. That's what changed my life and maybe what changed many of yours. So I'm going to wish all my Facebook Live friends a farewell, and I'll go back to Zoom in just a moment. Shalom.